My friends, would you like to hear a story? Yes. Okay, okay, it's early in the day, it's early in the day. I was hoping for a little bit more enthusiasm. Let's try it again. My friends, would you like to hear a story? Yes. Yeah! Awesome. I have a story I'd love to tell you, so it's perfect timing. It's a special story, though, so in order to tell it, I have to invite you aboard my time machine real quick, because uh, we're headed back to 18th century London. So if we as modern human beings step out of our time machine back then and go for a stroll along the River Thames, many things would look different to our modern eyes. But there's one thing in particular that would stand out, and that's the fact that all along the river on the embankment you would see sets of bellows, just like this, hanging there. And they were there to serve a very particular and serious medical purpose. Now if this sounds strange to you, hold on, I'm gonna give you the explanation but it's also going to get really, really weird. So back in the 18th century, it was a well-established medical fact that tobacco smoke was very good for you. It was thought to stimulate the entire body, but it was particularly good for the heart and lungs, very good for the heart and lungs. And it became a very, very popular treatment against a long list of ailments. Doctors were really excited because it was incredible what you could cure with tobacco smoke. And just to kick up the craziness level from our perspective just a little bit, it was also believed that the most effective way of administering this treatment was by use of an enema. You heard me correctly. I'm talking about tobacco smoke enemas. And no, I did not just make this up. It is fact. You can look it up afterwards. There's a lot of evidence, uh, among other things. Um, uh, this image here, where we see two uh, young hipsters of the day getting ready for a little health booster treatment. <laughs> So it sounds bizarre to us nowadays, but uh, tobacco smoke enemas became incredibly popular. They just took off and became this trend in health and wellness. And the doctors were super excited. Like, it was incredible the potential what they could cure with this miracle cure. So they were looking for new applications. And then one day they heard a story, a case study, if you will, that made them particularly excited. Apparently, someone had used a tobacco smoke enema to successfully revive a drowning victim a person believed to be dead from drowning. I'm not a doctor, and I would never claim to be anywhere near that smart. Nevertheless, I'm skeptical of this case study. I have questions. And uh, never mind the science, let's park that for a second. Like, first of all, I just think, how did this go down in the first place? That's some out of the box thinking right there. What happened? Like, they're panicking on the riverbank, there's a body there, like, what should we try first? Mouth to mouth? No, wait. I have a much better idea. Hand me that pipe you're smoking. <laughs> Another question that comes to mind is, uh, was the person dead? If not, was it the healing effects of, uh, of tobacco that made it happen? Or was it just the, the way it was administered itself? It would be, seems reasonable to spring back to life in such a situation. Unfortunately, the doctors back then didn't really ask these critical questions. They were just super stoked that they had another win for tobacco smoke. It was incredible what you could cure, cure with this. So they're like, what more evidence could you need? This stuff's incredible. And based on that, they set into production the first emergency tobacco smoke enema kits that they would then hang along the river to prevent people from dying. So the uh, first uh, prototypes they came up with had some uh, usability issues. <laughs> but uh, through uh, innovative design, they came up with a bellows system so you could administer the treatment from a safe distance. <laughs> and now you know why you'd see sets of bellows all along the River Thames in the 18th century. And no, I didn't tell you this story because I have a, a weird desire to share obscure medical facts with you. I told you this story because it's incredibly relevant to the topic at hand. Because what happened here is something that's very typical for human beings, especially in the role as researcher. When we find what we set out to find, when it's aligned with what we already believe to be true, we have a strong tendency to stop looking for information and instead just see confirmation. That's what psychologists call confirmation bias. And uh, according to the last 40 years of cognitive research, this is one of the most pervasive and detrimental of all the cognitive biases that we humans struggle with. And it's expressed as a tendency for us to search and recall information in ways that confirm our existing beliefs, hypotheses, and expectations. 
to accept evidence we agree with at face value, and to dismiss information we don't agree with unless the evidence is overwhelming. We saw all three examples in the story I just told you. And while it's easy to laugh at that story and kind of go, ah, morons, today, and, and mind you, we have learned a lot. We do know that tobacco smoke is not healthy for you, for example, and that maybe there are better ways of trying to revive a drowning victim. But still, confirmation bias is very much alive and kicking. And you could argue that there are aspects of modern society that intensify the effects and the consequences. The legendary investor Warren Buffett once said, what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that the prior conclusions remain intact. That's confirmation bias. He said this addressing what he saw as the biggest pitfall in investment. Once an investor had decided it was a good investment, it was almost impossible for him or her to stray from that initial hypothesis. And obviously, that leads to a lack of critical thinking and to a lot of bad investments. The internet in general is uh, basically a confirmation bias machine. You don't have to do a lot of searching to find confirmation for anything you want, no matter how ludicrous it is. And by the way, yeah, thanks for that, Google. We didn't have that problem before you came along. <laughs> Another good example of uh, a confirmation bias machine is basically social media, Facebook, for example. So maybe there's someone in your network you find particularly annoying, or you, you know, just don't agree with their opinions. What do you do? Well. Uh, you just block them. Ah, they're gone. Same thing, you have stuff showing up in your feed you don't want to listen to. What do you do? You hide it. It even says, see fewer posts like this, and so on and so forth, until you've created a perfect little confirmation bias bubble, an echo chamber where everyone agrees with you, and it just feels really, really nice. It's not a good reflection of reality. So again, not that we can't do it. We're just not very inclined to look for information. We're much more inclined to look for confirmation of what we already believe to be true. So the problem is that leaves, that limits our capacity for objective analysis quite a lot. And that is a serious threat to any discipline that seeks to uncover the truth. Science is a good example. Marketing and conversion optimization are also two very good examples. And I would argue, as we in optimization and marketing are trying to become more scientific and follow scientific methodologies, we also have to be aware of some of the pitfalls that Scientists are aware of. Scientists are very aware of confirmation bias and the detrimental effects it has. You could argue that the scientific method is there for the sole purpose of countering confirmation bias. <laughs> so in the rest of this talk, I'm going to go through two confirmation bias pitfalls that are very dangerous for marketers. And then we're going to look at how to overcome confirmation bias and thus become better marketers. <coughs> the first pitfall I like to talk about is torturing data. So this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. If you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> I love when I hear a reaction like this because it means <laughs> we're in a room full of people who understand what this means. But let's look at a couple of examples. Have a lar two large data sets here, a whole decade. There's a 93% correlation between per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese and the uh, number of people who died by becoming tangled in the bed sheets. I never knew this, but the data is there. Mozzarella is super dangerous, even, even if I can handle lactose. There's an even higher correlation of 95% between uh, consumption of mozzarella cheese and people who die by falling down the stairs. What? And even, it's even dangerous to go out swimming in natural water. There's a 90% correlation between mozzarella cheese and the number of people who die by drowning while in natural water. Not swimming pools, natural water. And in fact, if for Swiss cheese, it's only 40%. <laughs> so if you are a marketer, you can use data like this. You know, maybe, maybe you're, you're a marketer for Swiss cheese, and your biggest competitor is mozzarella. And you go like, did you know that it's a fact that you're much less likely to die if you eat Swiss cheese? Oh my god, I didn't know that. Do you have an example? Yeah, I have one right here. <laughs> Do you spend a lot of time on the beach close to natural water? Oh, you're in danger. Obviously, my point here is that correlation does not equal causation. And we have to be really, really careful that we don't see connections that aren't there just because we want them to be there. And sometimes we say, well, we have a very large data set. That can make it a lot worse. You have to be careful. There's one particular type of data that I think all of us in this room use every day. This type of data is particularly susceptible to torture. 
You can kind of tickle it a little bit and it'll confess to anything. Analytics data. So let's look at an example. You're working for a client. You're working on an important campaign. You had to get the conversion rate up to at least 7%. At the end of the month, you're looking at it and saying, I wonder what the results were. And uh, oh, you're so close, 6.65, oh, so close. Can't be true, I worked so hard on it. I'm a great marketer, I put so much effort in there. Let's see, there must be something wrong. What's it based on? Okay, um, sessions, 9,393 sessions and 625 leads. Oh, what's that, what's that next to it? That's users. How many users are there? there? Oh, 600, 600, 6,624. I wonder, I wonder what the conversion rate would be if we based it on that. Let's have a quick uh, look at it. Let's see. 9.44, yes! <laughs> it wasn't my fault. <laughs> this is the stupid metrics. Note to self, always use users until it doesn't work anymore. Then we'll find something new. <laughs> so I think this sometimes has to do with a little bit simplified view of what happens with you know, research and so on, new insight. I think we have a tendency to believe like this, two steps, <coughs> read some research, get new insight, oh, I'm smarter, cool. It's a little bit more difficult than that, a little bit more complicated in, in reality, and it has to do, again, with confirmation bias, confirmation bias cycle. It gets in the mix and it makes everything more complicated. You see there's quite a few extra steps here. So read the research, and then you basically have to first figure out if you agree with the findings of the research. If yes, then that's where confirmation bias kicks in. And then all you have to do is ignore any flaws in the research, and you keep your worldview, yay! And everything is back to normal just the way we want it to be. On the other hand, if you uh, don't agree with the research, confirmation bias kicks in, and then all you have to do is find a reason that the research is flawed, ignore the research, and then you can keep your worldview, yay! And everything is just the way we want it to be. So one thing I hear people say a lot when I talk about this is, but Michael, I do A-B testing, so I don't have this problem. Whoa. Realizing that you have to test stuff is a great step in the right direction, but it does not guarantee anything. In fact, I would argue sometimes split testing makes everything much worse. Here's an example. Very early on while you're running the test, you see a huge lift and you are stoked out of your mind. Look at this, it's incredible, we're geniuses. This could not be random. No, there's too much, too big of a difference. You pop the champagne, you call the client, you publish the blog post. If you had run it for its full duration, you would have seen that, uh, in fact, it didn't really do better. If anything, it did worse. <laughs> so I would argue that stopping the test when it shows what you want it to show is basically looking for confirmation. Understanding how long to run the test and doing that is looking for information. So you can do this, and I guess it's in, a, in the short term, it's very impressive. You get all these lifts and stuff, but at some point, someone's going to start asking questions. Your client or your boss is going to go, hey, like that series of 10 home runs with over 100% lift you did in a row, where's the money? Why can't I see it on my account? And at some point, you'll have to acknowledge they're saying it's because the lift didn't exist. It was imaginary. So be really careful with this stuff. Obviously. Doing your pre-calculations is really important. You can just Google it, uh, split test duration calculator. There's a bunch of them you can use out there. Question number two is, uh, can you torture qualitative data? Absolutely, it's very easy. Wouldn't you agree that this is a useful feature? Can you tell us why you love our product so much? This is leading the witness. This is instigating a certain outcome to please your own ego. A much better way to ask this question would be, can you tell us what you think of our product? But it's hard, it's very tempting to go down this other route. Okay, second pitfall, using marketer's <coughs> logic. So confirmation bias is sometimes called my side bias because it kind of, there's a tendency that we end up seeing everything from our own perspective, our, our own side. It's almost like this virtual reality filter through which we see, we create our own reality. And often the marketer's reality logic is very, very different from the user's. Sometimes it's, a, it's an awful clash. I've learned this the hard way. God damn, I've made so many mistakes. I'll just show you one example where I was awfully wrong. I was supposed to do a live critique of this landing page on stage as a conference, and I had just a short window of time to, do, uh, to prepare and do a little bit of research. So my marketer's logic tells me, stock photo! Ah, the worst thing you can do. Like, oh, this is horrible, horrible, horrible. 
And to show how horrible it is, it's basically, you can just, you just have to do a Google image search here and bang, you'll find her, you know? Friendly businesswoman <laughs> smiling at the office. She's, she's an interesting person though, because not only has she been uh, this friendly businesswoman, she's also been an architect, she's been a family doctor, she's been a gym doctor, she's been an animal doctor, she's been a hairstylist, she's been a nail stylist, she's been a professional photographer, she's been a flight attendant, she's been a, uh, a businesswoman winning at something, and a professional tennis coach. <laughs> So obviously now she needs to enroll into Ohio Christian University to get yet another degree to complete her, her career, right? So yeah, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be good stuff. I can't wait to show the crowd how, well, basically how awesome I am. I, could, I noticed this. So I, um, I did a usability test, uh, a quick one. Uh, it's called the five second test where you upload an image and people get five seconds to look at it and then they have to answer questions afterwards based on what they took away from those five seconds. So I asked, what do you think this page was about? Did the landing page seem trustworthy? <laughs> I was getting ready for the horrible, horrible critique. I was wrong, 88% were like, they nailed it, like a lot of detail. They even got like, yeah, and you can finish the degree in two years. I was like, this is amazing. Like they didn't just stare themselves blind on the, on the, on the stock photo. And 80% said it was absolutely trustworthy. Confirmation bias. I said, no, this can't be. I must be right. Do another test. So I find that one much more credible. So must other people. Then I can use that one and ditch the other one. God damn, again. <laughs> so I guess I had to eat this one and go, maybe the target audience is a little bit different than me. Maybe they don't spend hours scouring the internet for stock photo centers the way I do. Maybe that's just not a big part of their reality. So using marketers' logic can leads to this kind of, I'm right, you're wrong kind of attitude, or like, I'm smart, you're stupid. And I don't think that's very constructive for any relationship, especially not a client consultant relationship. I think the only, only time when you're really like onto something with calling you stupid is if they refuse to look at any other evidence or refuse to do research and they're just stuck in the way they're doing it. Then I start venturing to say, that's kind of stupid. Okay. Summarize, confirmation bias is a dangerous pitfall for marketers. It plays on our natural tendency to assume we're right, and it's sneaky. It happens without us knowing it. And that's why the, one of the reasons why it's so dangerous and so hard to notice, because it's just natural part of the way we use our brains. So let's look at how to overcome confirmation bias and thus become a better marketer. Step one, accept the fact that you could be wrong and be fine with it. Human beings are not very happy with being wrong. Marketers are deathly scared of being wrong, in my experience anyway. I used to be that too. And this is understandable. We have a lot riding on being right. We're supposed to be the experts. We're supposed to nail it. We're supposed to do home runs, knock it out of the park in the first try, yeah. It's just not very realistic. And if you're really scared of being wrong, you're making fear-based decisions, I think we can all agree that fear-based decisions are often not the best ones we can make. I'm not saying you're supposed to have a culture where you strive to fail and just make everything horrible. No, of course not. I'm just saying there's merit to the fail fast and iterate kind of way of thinking. You have to create a culture where it's actually possible to experiment and learn new stuff and fail fast and learn from that and do something better. That's actually a big part of science. Scientists don't try to just be right. A lot of that is testing hypotheses and saying, God, we were wrong, awesome, we learned that, what can we do now? Super important. And the Danish poet Piet Hein summarized the wisdom here very well in a poem, and I'll read it to you. The road to wisdom, well, it's plain and simple to express. Air and air and air again, but less and less and less. I still get goosebumps every time I, I read that thing. I think it's so beautiful. And this is I, what I, I say, this is the main thing I've learned from 10 years in CRO, is you have to be wrong a lot to be right. I've had enough humbling, actually humiliating experiences early on in my career where I thought I knew everything, like, and it felt really bad. I went through all eight stages of <laughs> grief. No, it's not true and stuff. And then finally you get to the re realization, yeah, I didn't know very much. I have to reinvent myself. And now I love the fact that I'm going to be a student forever in this business. I think it's a beautiful thing. That's one of the things I love most about CRO. Step two, seek out a different perspective. So one of the first things I do when I work with a new client 
or in the few, the one <laughs> in-house job I've had, is I seek out a different perspective. Who can help me answer the questions I can't? So I look at different people in the company, and then what I often do is I go straight to sales, straight to uh, customer success, because these people talk to customers all the time. And it's not like they're not biased, they just have a completely different bias than I do. They're very much biased towards the perspective of the user, of the customer. And that's very, very helpful for me. It's very self-serving. It's not because I'm you know, really, really out there looking for new relationships or anything. It just makes my work better if I can talk to these people. Here's an example. We had spent a while optimizing the checkout funnel for Unbounce. It's a SaaS product. And um, there were these bullet points uh, over here. And they were based on my marketer's logic. It's kind of funny in retrospect now because it's like, no waiting. Build a landing page right away. Your account is ready the second you sign up. People can't wait. Like, this is the best thing we can tell them. They're just dying to use our amazing product. 98% uh, customer satisfaction rating. Basically, I'm just saying we're pretty awesome. So um, I reached out to my colleague, Lou, in um, customer success, and I said, hey, Lou, does this sound like something our customers would ask? And she goes, nope. I said, oh, interesting. What would they ask? And she goes, well, I'd be billed during the trial. Can I cancel during my trial? Can I change plans? And I said, oh, it's quite different from what I thought. I said, what do you answer when they say that? She goes, this. And I said, do you mind if I steal that? She said, no, go ahead. So I stole it, and uh, I made a treatment based on that. And we tested it. And we ran the test for two business cycles. We had almost 900 account signups, and we had a 95% significance level. And we saw an 11% increase in signups. That far, that deep in the funnel, that's money in the bank. And this is, in my experience, what happens once you start doing the detective work. And that's why I do it. I used to get my kicks out of running random A-B tests and see all my great ideas, and then maybe get a false positive, and then pop the champagne. And now, the thing that really gets me going about this job is the detective work. I think it's amazing. You're digging through all these different layers. You're really trying to understand stuff. And I think that's also a, a positive way to look at it, because then the A-B test in the end is like the final thing you do to, to figure out if all this research you did actually, uh, your hypotheses, whether they, they hold, uh, whether, whether, whether they are true. <laughs> so it helps you challenge your beliefs. Get a different perspective. It helps you challenge your beliefs. It helps you do much, much better work and better tests and better optimization. Step three, break the confirmation bias cycle. So I showed you this earlier, and there's a very interesting way of, of breaking habits, and, and that's actually a, a good way to, to make it less intimidating to try to reduce the amount of confirmation bias that goes on in your brain. You can't completely escape it, but you can reduce it. And one of the ways of making it less intimidating is to think of confirmation bias as a bad habit, a bad habit that you can change, you can do something with. A way of changing habits is it's not really something new he presents here. It just has a different spin on it. This has been in psychology for a while, but it's a great book, and he has a good way of presenting it, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. So he talks about the habit loop, which basically consists of a cue, a routine, and a reward, and then that becomes uh, the habit loop, the habit. And so our, our brains try to automate anything that, that the brain can automate. It saves precious cognitive energy so it tries to turn anything into a habit once it sees it works, once you get a reward. The problem is the human brain can't really tell the difference between a good and a bad habit. So look at it a little bit closer here. So the cue is the trigger that sets off the habit. The routine is the action triggered by the cue. And then the reward is the reinforcement of the habit. So once you get the reward, the brain goes, check, that worked, awesome, let's do that again next time. So if you want to, so an example here, it could be, for example, uh, when I feel tired, that's the cue. Then the routine is I drink a bunch of Red Bull, and the reward is I feel awake all of a sudden. And then the brain goes, awesome, that works, let's do it again. So if you want to break it, then you have to identify these three steps. And once you've identified them, then you can try to, for example, change the routine or the reward, or both of them. So for example, you could go, well, what if when I get the cue, I could change my routine to drinking green tea and still get the same reward? That would be amazing. I'd have to drink. 10 times as much green tea as I'm used to with Red Bull, but at least I'm not like downing sugar all the time. It's healthier. So if we look at confirmation bias, one thing one can try to exercise is when you hear information that you don't agree with, you know, then normally it might be this. The routine would be to reject it 
And then reward is that you get to keep your worldview. And the same thing, information you agree with, well, you accept it at face value, and then you get to keep your worldview. So if we could change it a little bit, what I'd suggest is this. Information you agree with, then instead of just accepting you go, hey, wait a minute, I could be wrong, you do a little bit of research, and then maybe you get to keep, you get the same reward. You get to maintain your worldview. Or maybe you could change the reward, which is I get new insight that I learned from, and now I know something new, and I can go out and do better work. OK, we're almost done. And uh, so today I've told you about confirmation bias. I've shared some pitfalls, dangerous pitfalls for marketers. And I've given you some suggestions for how to work with it and how to mitigate it. So the reason why I talked about the habit loop is because I've been working a lot with that. I've been using it myself. And uh, one of the things I've done is I've created a new reward for myself. It's super embarrassing, but I'm going to share it with you anyways. OK. <laughs> so my reward is I hear a voice inside my head, and it compliments me when I successfully do this. And the voice belongs to what I see as the most righteous and intelligent creature in the entire galaxy. And I've, so I usually hear the voice inside my head, but I'm going to try to do it for you now. <clears throat> we'll see how it goes. OK. It goes a little something like this. Mm, much bias you have overcome, young Padawan. The force is strong in you. A true CRO master you will become. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm available for children's birthdays. I'll stick to the Star Wars routine and not the uh, confirmation bias stuff. So those are my good days. When I hear Yoda inside my head, it's a very good day. I call them my Yoda days. <laughs> but to be honest with you, most days it just sounds like Chewy. <laughs> I have no clue what the hell he's trying to tell me. <laughs> it's all cloudy up there. OK, let's uh, summarize real quick here. This is how you can overcome confirmation bias. Accept the fact that you could be wrong. That's the first step. Air and air and air again, but less and less and less. Learn by trial and error. Understand that being wrong is a big part of eventually being right. Seek out a different perspective and challenge your beliefs and break the confirmation bias cycle. OK, rounding off, I want to leave you with just two things. Just two things to take away from today. One, strive to have as many Yoda days as possible. And two, don't blow smoke up your ass. Or anyone else's for that matter. Thank you very, very much for having me.